One of the uh, most problematic uh, areas of the professing church and the professing Christian life is that it is very easy to look like a Christian and to act like a Christian when required, but that could be often so very different from what is happening and taking place in our hearts and in our lives. And that raises a very important question that I guess uh, another series, another subject uh, to look at on another occasion, but we'll deal with it very briefly just now. What is it that distinguishes the true from the false? What is it that separates a, a genuine living Christian from someone who just has a veneer or you know, a, a, an exterior that looks like a Christian? It's a question that we have to ask and we have to answer it and we have to do so constantly as we sit here in the house of God week after week. Now I know there could be many directions that we could take to give an answer, but let me say this, that the essence of genuine Christianity, when it all boils down to it, is what a man or what a woman or what a young person or a child has done with the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will always come down to this. Because time and time again, the Bible will speak about the, the true core meaning of Christianity as being in Jesus Christ. And that is something you cannot fake, you cannot feign, and you cannot pretend. We are either forever in him by faith, or we just simply know about him. And we know something to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what will follow on from that is exactly what we are discovering here in Luke chapter 7. Because that man or woman or that individual, that young person who is truly a child of God is, is going to be someone who demonstrates a, a passionate, fervent, heartfelt love for him. A love that is going to be seen and something which cannot be denied in this remarkable passage in Luke 7, we have two people who illustrate both sides of this equation for us. They are very different people, but God, through the Savior here in this passage, he sets them side by side. Now, I want to remind you today that the account that you're reading here in Luke 7 is in isolation. That just simply means we don't read of it anywhere else in the Gospels. Now, you might say, are you sure? Are you sure your arm hasn't got to your head? Or your tooth hasn't got to your head because these are familiar things. I've read these things before. Surely we've read of another Simon. Surely we've read of another individual who has oil and, and washes the feet of the Savior with water and, and, and dries it with her hair. Well, yes, there are similar things, but they're not the same occasion. Uh, there's no reason to think so. I don't have all the time to go into it, but uh, remind yourself that Simon the Pharisee mentioned here is not to be confused with Simon the leper that we read of elsewhere in the, in the New Testament, or even Simon uh, the apostle, the, or the zealot, as he's called. And the unnamed woman, we don't have her name, by the way, in Luke 7, is not Mary Magdalene. In fact, Mary uh, Magdalene appears in, in the next chapter in Luke uh, chapter 8. So we, we do not know anything really about this man and this woman, Simon and this unnamed woman, apart from what we read of here in Luke 7. Now, what we do read is fascinating. What you do read is, is deeply challenging. We need to get our minds and our thoughts around it. What do you read of about these two individuals? You're going to read about their mindset. You're going to read about how they think. You're going to read about their response to the Lord Jesus Christ. And most importantly, you're going to discover their reaction to what it truly means to be forgiven. And what follows and flows as a result of appreciating the fullness and the depth of God's forgiveness in the Lord Jesus. And all of this, all of this is summarized in the words of verse 47. Wherefore, the Savior says, I say unto thee, Simon, her, sons, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. That will raise a lot of questions for a lot of people. We want to do the best we can this morning to understand what it means to have a great love for Christ. I'm going to leave two thoughts with you as I finish today in the house of God. 
First of all, great love for Christ is the result of God's forgiveness. Great love for Christ is a result and a consequence of God's gracious forgiveness and truly being forgiven. Okay? That's what we want to look at first of all. The Savior says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Now notice in verse 47, midway through, he, he, he says this also, a little phrase that can be confusing. He says, for she loved much. And, and some might have the impression when they read verse 47 that the Lord Jesus is teaching this, that because she loves me in this way, I'm going to forgive her. You might read that verse and say, is that what it's teaching? Is Jesus saying, uh, because she loves me in this way, I'm going to forgive her as a result? Well, look, we know that cannot be true because that will conflict with everything else in the Bible. My dear friends, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible is it taught that God's forgiveness, which itself is gracious and full and free and purchased only by the highest cost, of Jesus' blood and his righteousness can ever be anything that you earn by any level of love or affection or desire or ambition. It, it just cannot be done. If it did, we would all be doomed because we would fail miserably. If it's to be how much we love him determines if we're forgiven or not. Uh, Paul explains, we even read there in Ephesians 2, those words, we're, we're children of wrath, we're, we're hostile, we're, we're enemies. Listen, people don't like those words. This is plain reality. That's what we are in our sins. No, to love the Savior as this woman did originated in the holy influences of God's Spirit by which she became a new creature. So the, the wording is along these lines, and this is the meaning, as it's demonstrated within the chapter. Jesus is saying, and I'm paraphrasing it slightly, look, look at her love. Look at how she loves me. She loves me like this because her sins are forgiven, not to earn forgiveness. As a result of truly feeling and knowing and sensing the wonder of what it means to be a child of God. It's a very different thing, but a very important difference. In other words, she experienced, this woman, what Simon did not know. That's what I'm contending for, by the way. I do not believe, and I'm going to try and prove this, I do not believe that Simon was someone that knew the Lord's forgiveness. And whenever the Jesus mentions, you know, little sins and little forgiveness, it's not because, you know, Simon was, you know, a, a top man and was almost there, but just a few things were wrong and a few little tweaks and you'll be all right, Simon. You don't need much forgiveness, you're nearly there. That's not the emphasis here. He's a great sinner, she's a great sinner. Just different lives. The point is this, that she experienced what Simon did not know. Now to, to really get to the bottom of this, we've got to look at the passage carefully. Luke introduces Simon the Pharisee as one who, on first impressions, is the sort of man that you would like to get to know. Seems a kind individual, kind sort, we might say. You know, he's called a Pharisee in verse 36 that, all, that immediately throws up our defense mechanism. You know, he's a Pharisee. And, and then you sort of go on a little bit. You think, he's not like the other Pharisees. He's, he actually wants to have the Lord Jesus Christ in his home. Do you see it in verse 36? He desires him that he would eat with him. And Jesus uh, accepts the invitation. He goes into the Pharisee's house and he sits down at food. They have a meal together. It, it all seems quite you know, respectable and, and polite and, and, and courteous and nice. And, and you know, if you just leave off the reading at verse uh, 36, you might think to yourself, well, well, this is a Pharisee. Okay, he's a religious leader, but he, he loves the Lord and he's being kind towards the Savior. Everything's fine until this woman comes on the scene. Because this now really shows us what Simon was in his heart. And so in verse 37, this woman that doesn't have a name comes onto the scene. She actually comes into the house where our Savior is. And, 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 and she goes before Lord Jesus Christ. And she begins to act in the way that we're going to think about very soon with her actions. Who was she? 
We don't have a name. Young people, we don't have a name. Names are very important. We don't have a name. And then you've got this title. She, she's called here in verse 37, a sinner. Now, why would the Bible say she's a sinner? Aren't we all sinners? Yes. We're all sinners here in the house of God this day. We're either sinners saved by grace or sinners outside of God's salvation. We're sinners who have been made saints. We're sinners who are still under condemnation. So why does the Lord, and, and through Luke, point out she was a sinner? Because it, it concerned really her great reputation or her bad reputation in society. Uh, and we don't, we don't know why, and people can speculate, but I'm not going to do this. But she clearly was something of an outcast in, in society. She had done terrible things. She was a, a, a person that no one wanted to know. And you go into Conway Square, you go into maybe into Bangor, into Belfast, and you might meet someone down the road, and you know what, they're not, they're not a Christian, but they're a nice sort, and you're going to have a time of day with them. But this person, they've just spent their life in the gutter of sin, and, and getting to alongside, I can't possibly associate with her. The worst of the worst. That's what we're dealing with here. And, 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 and she knew that Jesus was in this house of Simon and she immediately goes into the house and you know that tells me something about what she was. She did not care what people think. I must get to the one whom my soul loves. So it's a wonderful lesson in itself. And then a familiar scene begins to unfold. She, she brings in this alabaster box. The Bible says this. In verse 37. Now, what is an, an alabaster box that we read of here in the scripture? This would have been a, a white stone perfume uh, vase. I, I think we need to get some of these. Um, I, I, just to, to add to my crimes of hurting arms and losing teeth, I've been smashing things this week, dropping things all over the place, things made of glass. And then we're smiling here in the corner of my eye. So I, I, I need to. Uh, Marble stone things in the house. That's <laughs> why so I can't smash them so easily. This was something that was common. Uh, these, these white uh, stone uh, vases or vases, and, and they, they, it was filled with this, this perfumed oil, and she brings it in. And then she begins, isn't she? She's, it's just such a moving passage. She comes into the house, and here's this stoic Simon, and he served up, you know, the food and, 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 and a bit of something to drink on the side or how's the day as he speaks to the Lord Jesus Christ this woman comes in and she's weeping she's crying and tears flood her face and she and she and she takes her tears and she takes her tears and she washes the feet of the Savior and she takes her hair and she dries the feet and she takes the oil and anoints can you imagine something happening like that in your home in church. Imagine that. The Lord Jesus did not object. Simon did, inwardly. The Bible says, uh, in verse 39, that the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. Have you ever done that, Christian? You grumbled under your breath. You thought something uh, to yourself, oh, that's, that's not really the right way of being. And this is what Simon is, is doing here. And, he, and he, he, he questions the master. If, if he were a prophet, if he was a prophet, he would know what type of woman this was and the inferences, and he wouldn't let her near him. Do you start to see how different Simon and the woman are? First appearances look good, but now the heart of the matter is being seen. And so Simon uh, gestures with the eye, in a sense, and uh, his, his, his actions, and what, what he did, it all seemed praiseworthy. You're in my home, and you're, here, you're, you're sat at meat, and you've got food, and you're, you're, you're at my table, and you're under my roof. These are acceptable things. I'm, I'm, I'm the one that you should be pleased with. And he loathed this woman. It was J.C. Ryle in commenting upon this and referring to Simon, who said this, there was outward civility, but there was no heart of love. There was outward civility, but there was no heart of love. 
And today the problem remains ever the same. We may, and I, and I challenge all of us to think carefully, every one of you, we may show respect as Simon does and did. And we've got the respectability of our Christianity. And we look the part, and we sound the part, and we speak the part. But maybe, maybe the real problem is we have never known forgiveness. We've never been saved. And week after week and year after year, we sit here, why do I not love him? Why do we see other Christians burning with love for the Savior? Why, why do they love him in a way that I just don't know anything about? I'm doing it all right. I mean, I, I go to church, and I'm, I'm moral, and I'm good, and I'm kind, and I'm upright, and I, I, don't, I don't go every week, but you know, I'm not doing anything bad. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all these things, and, and I welcome people into my home, but I, I, I don't know anything of love. And, and, and the reality is, you don't know anything of forgiveness. You don't know anything of the depth of mercy in Christ. That's the point of this passage. True love for Christ flows from forgiveness. Forgiven. And so then to love. It can never be the other way around. The sense of our sins forgiven is the lifeblood of love to Christ. Do you know anything of this? And let me check my own heart as well. The great love for Christ, as we're looking at here this day in the house of God, is the result of God's forgiveness. Well, just one more thing as we finish here. Great love for Christ is then the root of our actions towards our Savior. So it's the, it's the, it's the reason uh, uh, for uh, our love, we might say, the, the forgiveness of God. But the great love for Christ is the root of our actions. This, this, this love that we are to have, it, 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 it springs forth into action, into doing and into being. And that's verse 47 again. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Again, you've got to understand what Jesus is saying here in this passage and make sure we're correct. Our Lord is not making a point, and I want to make this clear, that he's saying Simon has few sins, needs little forgiveness, and so understandably loves little. Again, when you examine that thinking in the light of the Bible, it makes no sense. And, and the reason why is, is when we understand sin. You see, we, we cannot come to Luke 7 and, and look at words little and think of the themes of, of great and, 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 and see the actions of this woman and what Simon did and think, okay, so it's possible to, to be a Christian and, and not... And not be that bad in society and just think of sin as a small thing and, and, you know, and forgiveness not really as a, as a great thing. But those who are wicked people in society, they're the ones that should really be on their knees saying, Lord, have mercy upon me. You know, we've got to get away from that thinking. One sin constitutes an eternal debt. One sin makes all of us great sinners. Do you, do you recognize that? That's, again, not my theology. This is the teaching of the Word of God. So the, the, the whole thrust of this passage and the parables that we're looking at very soon here, it's all about the sense of, in, of indebtedness, the, 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 the awareness, because she was forgiven, and, and, and a heart that was then invested in this. My, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Oh, how I love him. And how I desire him. In fact, there's no word from the Savior that Simon ever knew forgiveness. Whereas for her, the Lord says very clearly, verse 48, thy sins are forgiven. I believe she came as a forgiven soul, by the way. I don't know when she was converted. Many believe it was just moments before even. And everything's so fresh in their minds. Their thoughts, all the life of sin that she had done, it's a recent thing. But Simon wasn't. Not at this point anyway. And to this woman, our Lord says, thy sins are forgiven. And, this, and, and, and the Lord makes it even abundantly clear that it was this woman's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that became the means or the instrument by which she received. 
Again, this is really important. It is not the volume of tears that washed away her sins. It's because she, by simple faith, received Christ and was made a child of God and it floods her soul. I am forgiven. This became the root of all of her actions that she showed. And that's what we're going to be thinking about just in these last closing minutes. Actions, in this sense, always speak louder than words. You've often heard that phrase, haven't you? Maybe the young ones have heard that at home or school or wherever you are. Actions speak louder than words. And they do. They do. And we, we, we accept that. And, and why is that true of this passage? Well, what is interesting to see is that both this, the Pharisee and the woman did things. They both did things. They both had actions. Simon did something. He brought Jesus into his house and fed him. The woman did things. She wept. Washed his feet, anointed his feet, dried with her hair. Simon's actions, I, I would suggest to you today are all about acts of politeness and courtesy about the Lord Jesus Christ. Keeping up appearances, as many people often say. The fundamental difference is this. Every act of this woman was about who Christ is. You're you're the lily of of the valley. You're my bright and morning star. You're the light and life of my salvation. You are the fount of my forgiveness. For Simon, it's about how can I, you know, please people. I've, I've, I've ticked this box. I've been seen with him, but I'm still a Pharisee. For this woman, I don't care what others think or say. I must know him. And I want to say to you the essence of your Christianity, it has to be this. Knowing him. Knowing him and none but him. And what flows from the heart that knows him it will be these actions of consecration, affection, and love. To rebuke Simon, particularly, the Lord gives this fascinating parable or illustration about two men that were in a debt to a certain creditor. Uh, one had a debt of 500 pence. I know these are authorized version words, and uh, we look at these words and say, well, that doesn't seem like much, you know, 500 pence. Uh, compared to the other one who had 50 pence, the equivalents are not so easy to, to give. Uh, come across different examples. Some people think in, at that particular time, maybe around sort of 20 pounds for the 500 pence, which would be a lot you know, in, in today's terms. But let's just use a, another illustration, to maybe to think a bit more clearly. Say it's 500 pounds, 50 pounds. Big difference between 500, 50. Is that what the Lord is teaching? The big difference between someone's sin and another person's sin? No. No, that, that's not the lesson. Remember, whether it's one pound, you're in debt. One penny in debt. That's the point. Maybe you're not saved today. Maybe you've got this thinking in your head. I'm not that bad. I'll be okay. Ah, oh, no, one One sin, forever condemned. And and, and the Lord gives us this this parable of the two debtors and the creditor, and then this marvel of marvels. Neither of them had the ability to pay. The one that had a 500 pence debt, the one who had a 50 pence debt, 500 pounds, 50 pounds, whatever we say here, they couldn't pay it. And the creditor was gracious. And uh, he forgave them. Now, we don't want to base all of our theology upon a a parable because when the Lord forgives, as we shall see when we deal with the atonement in the Bible class, it's not an arbitrary forgiveness. There's a grounds for forgiveness. That is, God meets his justice in the death of Christ. But the illustration is this. There is this gracious release. And the Lord then asks a question to Simon in verse 43. Which of these two will will love the kind, gracious creditor the most? Now Simon rightly concludes, well, it has to be the one with the bigger debt because, well, it was weighing them down. And Savior says, that's right, that's true, you've come to the conclusion. And Jesus applies it all. And he says, Simon, what is your problem? I've come into your house, Simon. I've come into your dwelling place. 
I don't deny the fact that you've not given me meat and food. You've sat me down. You've opened your door. But really, have you loved me? Have you really loved me? Simon, I've come into your house, but you have not given water to wash my feet. That was a custom in Israel. And, and it, it was a, a sign of humiliation, of, of, of devotion. I will do this as a gesture of love and kindness. I've come into your house, Simon. And you know what? It all looks well. It looks fine. It looks good. But you haven't given me one drop of water to wash my feet. But she, well, she, she's, she's, done, she's done more, so much more. She has washed my feet with tears. Simon, I've come into your house. Verse 45, thou gavest me no kiss. Let me stop there. That's the physical kiss, of course, greeting, we might say. What about the spiritual? You've come into the house of God this day, but have you kissed the Son by faith? Is there a heart that loves him? Is that why you're here? Simon, I've, she, she has kissed you. She hasn't stopped. She hasn't stopped. And you can't give me one kiss. Simon, I've come into your house and my, uh, with oil thou didst not anoint me, but this woman hath anointed my feet with, with ointment. This is the point. This is what we call. It's not an ostentatious, showy religion that he's approving in the form of this woman. And it's not sentimentality just for the sake of it or emotionalism just for the sake of it. But these are real feelings of devotion and love. And they flow and they stem and they are there. These actions of devotion because of this sense. I am forgiven. He died for me. And oh, I love him. It's not difficult. And the reason why you don't love him and the reason why you spend all your life never wanting him is because you've never got to the cross. You've never been saved. That's a hard thing for people to admit. It means uh, a lot of putting down a pride and saying, I've just, I just never been saved. But there's still time, isn't there? There was time for Simon. Thank God there was time for Simon. And this woman was in time. If we say we are reconciled to God and pardoned and forgiven, there will be a natural longing and love. I'm not saying these are the actions that you will do, and I'm not saying that we'll always do it to the same extent. But surely, surely, we can say, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. We will want to be at his feet. We will want to take his place. We will want to kiss the son. We will want to go before him. We want to give everything we have to him. We want to count everything but loss, as Paul says, and as dung, that we might know him and win him. Here is a great love for Christ. May God bless his precious word.